every Sunday school child or new believer learns what God's greatest gift is. We all know that God's greatest gift is His Son who came to give us spiritual life. But I don't know about you, but I've never heard a sermon on what God's second greatest gift might possibly be. And I don't know that we necessarily have to agree how it ranks in this order, but definitely somewhere in at least the top three or four, we have to consider this planet as one of God's greatest gifts to us. This planet is what provides everything we need for our physical life. And as we know, especially, for example, from the letters written by the Apostle John, we know that the physical does matter to God. We were never created to float around in the emptiness of outer space. We were created to live on a planet that gives us the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the food that we eat, the materials that we use to make every single thing that we have. This planet also feeds our soul. It gives us the incredible natural beauty that surrounds us. And it is clear all through the Bible that God takes great pleasure in his creation, whether it's the smallest, most insignificant aspect of it, or whether it's a distant galaxy or nebula far away. My father, a science teacher as well as a teaching elder in our local church, was known for the slides that he would put together back in the day when people used slides. He would have a slideshow that he would take around to camps and youth groups and uh, churches and organizations. And he would show people the marvels of the universe, the distant things that we're only starting to see with the most powerful telescopes that we have. And he would refer to those as God's art gallery, things that God created simply for the pure pleasure of their beauty, something that no human eye would see until today. And even still, we know there's so much that we haven't seen yet. But it's not only that. It's the fact that we as humans are told that we have a special relationship with nature. So in Genesis 1, chapter 1, first book of the Bible, it says, God said, let us make human beings in our image, reflecting our nature. And that verse has a so that, it has a reason attached to it. And the reason is no mystery. It follows immediately from this. It is so that we can rada, is the Hebrew word, every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. Now, Rada has been translated originally as have dominion over. But rather than argue over what the proper translation is, I think that seeing this word used elsewhere in context lends new meaning and clarity to it. So, for example, in Psalms, this word Rada is used, and it refers to a godly ruler. May he Rada from sea to sea. To what? in order to oppress, in order to extract all the resources from, in order to enhance the personal gain? Of course not. May he rada to deliver the needy when he cries to help, the afflicted also, and him who has no helper, to have compassion on the poor and the needy and the lives of the needy he will save. So the word rada is clearly associated with taking care of those that do not have the resources and the ability. That we have. And then in Genesis 2, it continues and it says, The Lord God put man into the Garden of Eden too, and the words here are Abad and Shamar. Forgive my Hebrew accent, I do not speak Hebrew. <laughs> but these words mean to serve or to protect or guard or keep. And they carry the connotation of stewardship. Imagine if we were given a piece of land by someone who we love and respect more than anyone in the world, and that person has invested in that land and cares deeply about the smallest blade of grass or insect on that land. And imagine if, rather than cultivating it and caring for it, imagine if we extract every penny of value we can from it and leave it a crushed and broken ruin. Instead, imagine if we took that land and we invested in it, we took care of it, we made sure that it was healthy, that the soil was healthy, that it could produce crops, that it could feed people, it could provide habitat for animals and plants. That would be fulfilling our responsibility. Here's the interesting thing, though. Often, we assume that nature or creation is other than us. So we read that verse in Genesis 1, and we assume that means that we are to care for every living thing, plants, and animals. And in fact, this carries through to modern society today. The Cambridge Dictionary defines nature as all the animals, plants, rocks, etc. in the world that exist independently of people. 
So it's as if there is this barrier between people and nature. But here's the thing. We are living things too. And so when we are told to care for all living things, that is not only plants and animals, it obviously must include humans as well. Traditionally, we have often interpreted this in an egocentric perspective. An egocentric perspective puts humans on the top of the pile, resting our feet, so to speak, on the rest of nature. And we know that in the Bible, the concept of resting your feet on someone or something implies conquering enemies. It does not imply a rada or an abad or a shamar. But then in the world, we may say, oh, well, humans are just one of every living thing and we're no different than any other. What we believe, though, is we believe that we do have a special role, but that special role is to care for, to protect, to guard, to keep all living things, including our sisters and brothers. 